everybody. Welcome to Gossip Finance. I'm Duncan Sandlin. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to have a fun show today. On today's show, we've got Stormy Daniels' testimony. We're going to go through that and uh, kind of how the media covered it. We're going to cover Christy Nome still trying to walk back, killing her dog, um, and also lying in her book. Uh, RFK Jr. reports that uh, he has a brain worm, so an actual worm in his brain, so we'll cover that. Um, let's see, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's trying to oust Speaker Johnson, and... We'll cover Trump on abortion and what Biden's been up to and a lot more. Uh, so thanks for joining us. So yeah, we took kind of a bye week last week. And of course, everything happens when you take a bye week. So um, we're going to have to do some catch up today. But the one thing we did miss last week, Stormy Daniels testified in the Trump New York civil trial. Now, or not civil trial, criminal trial. Um, now, I want to cover this because I think this is important to, to understand. The case is is that he falsified his business records to cover up the affair with Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, and they also paid off a doorman. Um, they, they paid them off to cover that up. Now, falsifying your business records, it's a minor misdemeanor. It's a slap on the wrist. It's not a big deal. Paying people off to keep quiet, also legal. Not a big deal. Um, I mean, depending on your view, but it is legal. So that's not the big issue. The big issue is he did it to subvert the election and he used campaign, some campaign money to do that. So when he does all that, now he's doing the false, the misdemeanor falsification of the business records, but he's doing it in commission of another crime, which makes it a felony. It's the same concept of if I break into somebody's house, it's breaking and entering, it's a minor offense, it's a misdemeanor. But if I commit another crime while I'm in their house, like I steal something, now it's burglary, now it's a major felony. So that's the whole issue here. So the, the, everybody's focused on the sex and everything else, but the real issue here is, did he pay these people off to manipulate the election? If he did, it's a felony. And that's all that the prosecution's trying to establish. And Michael Popak's gonna hammer this home a little bit better for you. Um, so I just wanna get that out of the way before we get to what Stormy said. It's Donald Trump in New York. It's about the checks, not the sex. I know we spent a lot of time. It was really interesting and titillating to hear about, uh, you know, the sex life or the sex acts or the sexual misconduct of Donald Trump. Sure, I wanted to hear about the rolled up magazine. It even made the judge laugh when Stormy Daniels talked about it. But this case, keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your mind on the money and the money on your mind. It's about the checks, not the sex. Which... <laughs> and so he's right. That's what it's about. So the fact that he had sex with Stormy Daniels, whether it was consensual or not, I mean, it's kind of vague. Um, the way she describes it, it's not consensual, but she said it was sort of consensual. But it, that could have been a separate crime. But the real crime here that he's on trial for is covering this up to manipulate the election. That's it. And the whole point of having Stormy Daniels testify that, he, that she was paid off, that she did have sex with him, is it establishes motive. And that's all it really does. She's not like the big key witness here. She's probably the most exciting witness we're going to hear from, but um, probably the most interesting, but she's not the key witness because she can't attest to anything he actually did for paying her off. She wasn't there. She got paid off through Michael Cohen and Keith Davidson, who was her lawyer at the time. So all she's really establishing here is does, does Trump have a motive to hide this because he thinks it's going to damage in the election? And that was where her testimony became relevant is when describing the act, and she described it in incredible detail, um, with, she could describe the tile in the bathroom, she described the layout of the hotel room they were in, the sexual position, what she was wearing, what he was wearing. I mean, it was a very credible, credible story that she gave. Um, and it's consistent with the story she's been telling now for the last few years. The other thing about it that was interesting is that I could kind of overlooked, but the prosecution kind of hammered home really well, was this happened, this one time, you know, thing that, that, that happened, happened back in 2006. And yet he doesn't pay her off until 2016, right before the election. So for 10 years, he didn't care about this, right? And it wasn't an issue. But then all of a sudden when the election's coming, now it's an issue. So it, it lends to the credibility. Plus, the salaciousness of what happened where he basically invited her to dinner. She met him at the hotel room. Then he cornered her, 
basically told her she wanted to be successful and have a career or he was going to put her on The Apprentice, but she had to sleep with him. So she, he kind of coerced her, his bodyguard standing outside the door. So he kind of coerced her into it and she did it and, you know, wasn't, you know, she said she blacked out at one point because probably she was traumatized because she was in her 20s at the time and he was like 60. So I can see where it was, it was pretty, pretty shocking to her. Now, that's the story, but but the horrificness of the story and just how salacious and, and gross it was and sleazy, that's what he was afraid of getting out, especially right after the Axis Hollywood tape where he talked about grabbing women by the pussy. So now this lends to the motive that, oh yeah, Trump has a huge motive to bury this story before the election, because if it gets out in the election, he's screwed, right? Because at that point, already, a lot of the GOP was already leaving his side. They were basically throwing him under the bus because of the Access Hollywood thing. If one more thing had come out, it could have buried him, buried the election. So that's why this is important, because it lends to his motive. It doesn't lend to the crime. She can't attest to the crime at all. All she can attest to is what happened, which establishes motive on his part. But she can't tell you what his motive actually was. She doesn't know any of that. So I wanted to point all that out because it's not, she didn't really, it, it was interesting, it was exciting in the press, but it wasn't the big point of the case. The big point of the case is all the paperwork that followed up that shows that he did all this to cover it up. And then Michael Cohen is going to attest directly to it. But you got to remember too, David Pecker came in, was the first witness for the prosecution, and David Pecker already established that he did this with Trump for the first two payments for the first two incidents, right, for the doorman and for Karen McDougal. The third incident's the only one that hasn't really been established. They pretty much established he's guilty of the first two. Right now, they're just nailing down the last one. So that's all that's going on. But what happens is you see it jump back and forth. So I wanted to get a couple comparisons here because the media, you know, jumps all over this and understandably so, it gets clicks. I mean, I'm doing it here, so can't really judge them. But I want to give you a kind of an example. So here's Lawrence O'Donnell. Here's a guy who's more sort of center left kind of guy. And he's going to talk a little bit about it, but he's going to pull out actual transcripts and he's going to read them to you of the cross-examination from the Trump's lawyer trying to discredit Stormy Daniels' story. And I think this is interesting how he does it. And then we're going to look at some comparisons from Fox News. So we'll jump into Lawrence right now. Against Stormy Daniels. The orange turd landed an hour oh let me let me point this out stormy daniels made a they, they that was one of the things of the cross-examination was they pulled out a tweet where somebody made fun of her and she referred to donald trump as the orange turd and so that was that was a big thing in court where they had to keep repeating so by orange turd what did you mean thing so he's gonna get into that sorry sorry i didn't give you that context into a belabored cross-examination by Susan Necklace that was repetitive, tedious, and almost entirely irrelevant. At 10.20 a.m., high-priced lawyer Susan Necklace said to Stormy Daniels, quote, isn't it a fact that you keep posting on social media how you're going to be instrumental in putting President Trump in jail? Answer, show me where I said I would be instrumental in putting President Trump in jail. Question. All right, Ms. Necklace, if we could show the witness J43, please. Question. Do you recognize that as your post? Answer, yes. Question. And I don't see the word instrumental or jail. Ms. Necklace, blow it up a little bit more. Susan Necklace then shows the post on all of the screens in the courtroom for the jurors to see and for the spectators to see and for Donald Trump to see. And then she says, quote, you were responding to the post, someone else's post there. Answer, yes. Someone calling me a human toilet. So I capitalized on the joke. Question, the other post, Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, a.k.a. the human toilet, are their star witnesses, right? Answer, yes. You said, exactly, making me the best person to flush the orange turd down. Answer, yes. <laughs> So, Susan Necklace brought the orange turd into the courtroom and kept it there. 
the questioning about the orange turd went on and on. Stormy Daniels said, quote, I don't see instrumental or jail there. You're putting words in my mouth. Question. So when you said you were the best person to flush the orange turd down, you weren't saying you were going to be instrumental in causing him to be convicted of a crime? That was not what you meant? Answer, no. Question, what does that mean? Answer, I'm pretty sure this is hyperbole. If somebody calls me a toilet, I can say flush somebody. See how that works? Now, trying to explain a joke to a lawyer in court is always pointless. Question. You said you were going to flush President Trump. Answer. I didn't say President Trump. It says orange turd. So if that's what, what's interpreted by you, question. What do you mean? Answer. I don't know what I mean. Question. You have no idea? Answer. I'm also not a toilet, so it's all... I'm asking you whether you knew what you meant when you said an orange turd. Answer, yes, I do. Question, what did you mean? Answer, I meant I'm not a human toilet, so if they want to make fun of me, I can make fun of them. Question, you don't want to admit you meant Mr. Trump? Answer, I absolutely meant Mr. <laughs> Trump. Question. Oh, we don't need to watch it anymore, but... But you see, she was honest. I mean, she was she was pretty direct, and the the cross examination, from what I read, did not go super well and dragged on and on. They, she cross examined her for a couple hours, um, and never really got anywhere. But that was what I heard. Now we do have um, Janine Pirro with Laura Ingraham, and Janine's got a very different view of what the cross-examination was. So I'm just gonna show you the comparison here. So they're gonna, we're gonna jump into the other side here, the conservatives. Joining me now is Judge Janine Pirro, co-host of The Five. Judge, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're in that overflow room today. Mm -hmm. the, the rest of the uh, cross of Stormy Daniels and then the redirect of her, <clears throat> what stood out? What stood out to me was that she was a very prepared witness for direct examination, I think overprepared. And when they got to cross-examination, she was a different person. Uh, she kept denying things that were, you know, that there was evidence that she was lying. So she would say things like, no, I didn't do it for the money. I just wanted to get my story out. But then she's cross-examined and they said to her, you could have had a press conference Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. You could have talked. You were negotiating with Slate, but you made a decision not to go with Slate because they weren't giving you money. So you ended up going with the NDA, getting $130,000. And then what you did was you then started, you talked to Anderson Cooper. So I'm going to clarify that real quick. Uh, she's screwing up the timeline. When she took the payment, yeah, she didn't want the story to get out. She did. She wanted to hide it. And then she testified to that, too, where they asked her about, um, you know, you wanted to admit, you know, or wanted to get the story out about having sex or admit you had sex with Donald Trump. And she said no one would want to admit they had sex with Donald Trump. That was she wanted to bury the story because she wanted to hide it from her from her husband and from, you know, from getting out. So she took the money instead, hoping to just get it done. And she didn't she said she didn't care about the money, whether she's lying or not. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Maybe she is a, a greedy and selfish and she just wanted it for the, the money and she was just trying to blackmail him. That's fine. It still doesn't it still gives it more motive than for him to try and bury it to try to win the election. So it doesn't excuse his motive. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense what Janine's getting at here. She's just trying to, it's, it's the optics look so bad. And she's looking at it from the election standpoint in their audience. But it's not really relevant to the case, whether or not Stormy blackmailed him or not. Or The question is, is did it happen? And was, did Trump have a reason to want to hide that? That's it. That's all they were trying to establish. You talked to In Touch, you talked to Vogue magazine, you did all these interviews, you broke the NDA, 
and yet she's trying to establish herself as this credible witness who at every turn on cross-examination is actually uh, destroyed. She was decimated. And at the end of the trial, at the end of her testimony, you realize she didn't lay a hand on Donald Trump. She had no personal knowledge, and she said this, she had no personal knowledge of Donald Trump's involvement with the She's right on the last part. She's right. She didn't have any knowledge of Trump's involvement with the payment. She didn't know anything about that. That wasn't, didn't really affect her. Um, all she knew was Keith Davidson and Michael Cohen, and she didn't know what Trump's involvement or what his knowledge was. Either. She just wanted to get it buried. So, interesting point on the two examples there, where you have Lawrence O'Donnell actually reading you what kind of happened to show you an example to make his point about the cross-examination was kind of a joke because they kept bringing back that that tweet and the orange turd thing and, and, and you know you're, you're attacking her and attacking her and attacking her and it looks bad because you're basically attacking the person that's potentially the victim in this whole situation um and i don't think it played well with the jury and that was kind of his point and then you're judging Ingo. well no 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 it she lied the whole time lied 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 and yet we're not getting any examples of when, where she lied and they sit there, well, she obviously never laid a hand on Donald Trump. Well, where did you get that? Because she stayed consistent with the story. <laughs> she was there. There's a photo. There's photos of her there. There's a photo of her with Donald Trump. So you see the comparison. One, they're both trying to spin it, right? But one is actually spinning it in a way that it has a lot of evidence to back his spin, and the other is just spewing shit. Um, so I just wanted to give that kind of example. But Fox News got more desperate. I want to go into this just because it was just horrific. I normally would have skipped all this, but then it got into, they got so desperate with this and how bad the optics looked and, and you know, and their guy that they're always praising and, and saying wonderful things about and they've got to play to their audience that it went straight from, she's uh, Judge Janine trying to, she lied, she lied, she lied, but it was pretty clear that she held her, held her ground pretty well and, played off real well of the jury. Um, there were different points in her testimony where the jury and the judge were laughing, um, which is not a good sign for the defendant, Donald Trump. <laughs> so Fox News took on a new strategy, which is an old strategy, which is slut shaming. So we'll jump into a couple of clips on that because it got bad. Number one, the judge sounds like a perv because he wants her to talk in lure detail and he's asking her to speak more slowly. That's gross. Number two, Let's say that let's say the transaction did take. Okay, real quick, <laughs> the judge asked her to speak slower because she was rambling, and he couldn't understand what she was saying. The other thing was is the judge objected a couple times. The judge actually objected to some of the details of the sex act coming out because he thought they'd be prejudicial to the defendant. Right, and then later Trump's tr lawyers asked for a mistrial because Stormy Daniels came out too many salacious details that might make the jury prejudicial and the judge said you didn't object I, I the judge objected a couple times but they, they didn't object so he's like you can't sit here and say we want to mistrial because all that got out when you didn't even object to it you never filed a motion in lemonade to try and prevent her from saying any of this you just let her do it so you can't sit there and say more well, mistrial now <laughs> man come on so that's all bullshit right there from what, kennedy Take place. I'm talking about the physical one. Her being surprised that she was going to a hotel room alone with a man to have body congress is like Pete Sampras being surprised at, uh, at being invited to a tennis court and you want to see his serve. And then he says, you know, I started shaking when I saw a tennis racket. I didn't know what to do with it. It's like, bro, you've won 17 majors. And, you know, it's like, it's, this, this woman saying that she blacked out because she was so nervous it's like a surgeon saying he barfed at the sight of blood. It's a little hard to believe. You don't think... Now... <sighs> Once again, she's a porn star. She should have saw this coming. At the time, she was like 25 or 26. So, Trump invites... Trump. She meets Trump at this golf tournament thing. She was at... Uh, I think the porn company she was with was sponsoring something there. Like a hole. One of the holes of the golf tournament. Anyway, Trump invites her to dinner... She initially doesn't want to go, but then decides her friend talks to her. Oh, you should do it because it'll be a good story. She goes to meet him at his hotel room, goes in, his bodyguard's there. So she thinks it's fairly safe, but she goes in and 
then, you know, he pretty much accosts her there about the whole situation. No, she said, there's a, okay, well, but she's a porn star. She has sex for money. So, yeah, but she has sex for money on camera with other people in the room. There's a contract. <laughs> there's a consent form. She's already approved the guy that she's going to have sex with. She's not being accosted in a hotel room by a stranger who's twi over twice her age and who's kind of threatening her career by, by saying, well, if you don't do this, you know, if you don't have sex with me, I'm not going to help out your career or do anything. And even then, he never did help out her career. But that's my point is the comparison of a surgeon barfing at blood. It's like, well, what if I kidnapped the surgeon and forced him to do surgery in a hotel room on somebody he really didn't want to do surgery on or surgery he really didn't want to perform and I was telling him if he doesn't that it's going to ruin his career <laughs> nah, I can see where he might be a little nervous and, and black out or throw up or something because it's, a, it's, a, it's duress is when it's happening under so different example but once again it's her fault for going to the hotel room she should have known that he was going to try and sexually assault her. She should have known that. It's the whole thing they used to do in the 90s when I was a kid about, oh yeah, the rape victim. Well, what were you wearing? You know, when you dress like that, you're kind of asking for it. No, you should be able to dress however you want and <laughs> and not have to worry about getting raped. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if I walk down the street and I get mugged and the cops, well, why were you wearing that watch? <laughs> why were you wearing that suit? You shouldn't have looked that good. Otherwise, they wouldn't have mugged me. You should have looked like shit. I was like, I should be able to dress how I want to dress. But that's the same thing they're doing here. You're a porn star. You should just expect that you're just going to get sexually assaulted all the time. You're asking for it. <laughs> it's kind of that argument. And it doubles down, and it gets worse because then we get God, just a total scumbag. We'll get in here in a second. Um, Greg Gutfeld. Look at these humans. Oh, Greg, just we got an ad. But Greg Gutfeld, he's got his own little stupid comedy show kind of thing on Fox News, which I don't know why. He, I don't know that he's funny. Um, I don't think he is, but, you know, maybe people do. But he's got his little show, and it gets uh, it gets bad because he jumps in on this, and it just uh, it just gets really bad. So we're going to watch Greg Gutfeld. I think he's on the five talking about this right now. I love that this... this event with Stormy happened almost two decades ago, yet we're having this trial just months before the election. But no, we're not out to get Trump. It just so happens it falls during this time. And no, the number of charges is irrelevant if they're all the same charges. 80 times zero is still <laughs> zero. By the way, I always thought the missionary position is when you pray for sex. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Here's some things. I'm going to get into the salacious details. I, I apologize in I advance. I, I love how Joe Scarborough says he, he was worrying about what, Mel oh, yeah. what Melania oh, yeah. hears. Yeah, right. Save it, you phony. Stormy claims that she blacked out in this tryst with Trump, but she wasn't on any drugs or alcohol. You blacked out without drugs or alcohol. Some of us call that sleeping. <laughs> now, it could, it could be that she really blacked out after having sex with Trump, which is... A compliment. Uh, <laughs> truly, he screwed the brains out of her. Oh, God. That <laughs> makes him a sex god. <laughs> I love that the big criticism. So now we went even further, right? So we went from she's lying, she's full of shit, there's no evidence to support that, right? Just flat out lies. Then you went to Kennedy going, no, 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 slut shaming. It was her fault. For going there in the first place she should have known that he was going to try and sexually assault her then you got greg Gutfeld going well she blacked out so it must be because he's awesome at sex so yeah it just proves that as long as it's as long as as long as you're good at sex when you rape the girl it's all a okay it just it's just amazing to me um but yeah that's how they spun it instead of actually getting to the actual reality of what Michael Popak was started with, which is, it's not terribly relevant, the sex. The only way it's relevant is to show that there's there's absolute motive for Trump to commit the crime. Right? It gives him motive. That's all she's there to establish. She's not even the most important part of this case. Um, it's, it's the most interesting, sure, but it's, it's not what we're here for, and it's not really the point. 
but if they avoided that at all costs, but then they couldn't directly, you know, go with her testimony, so they had to find some way to make it about it's her fault or something wrong with her. It's just blame the victim shit. So that was basically that. I, I just wanted to cover that because I just thought that was a fascinating, fascinating dichotomy between how two different things happen. But speaking of kind of different things about lying and bullshit going on on the right, we have Christy Nome. Now, we reported on this, whatever, a week ago, um, over a week ago, Christy Nome had her new book come out. It was called, I think it's called uh, No Going Back or No Way Back or something like that. And... In it, she tells a story about shooting her uh, family puppy, who was like 14 months old at the time, and then shooting with a, a goat they had or something. Um, and just it, it is one of those things where it came out later that she tried to put this story in her previous book years ago, and her campaign advisors told her, don't do it, don't do it, it's a horrible story. Don't. And so she finally did it this time, and it backfired, and it looked terrible. And then she, it got worse, because as people were reading through the book, she mentions that she met and stared down Kim Jong-un, who's the dictator of North Korea. And she never met Kim Jong-un. <laughs> There's no possible way she could have met Kim Jong-un. Um, and if she was there, it was secretive, because there's no record of her being in, in Korea at all. So well, I just want to jump into this, because she, she got hosed hosed on her book tour going around to the press trying to push her book she got absolutely hosed by the press about just what was in the book so we're gonna watch some of it just because it's hilarious specifically when you write in the book i remember when i met with north, north korean dictator kim jong-un i'm sure he underestimated me that as i understand is now being removed from the book at your request. Yes, when correct? I became aware of that, we changed the content and uh, the future editions will be adjusted. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that. I've met with many, many world leaders. I've traveled around the world. Uh, I should not have put that anecdote in the book. And uh, at my request, they have- That specific it. How, didn't happen? How, uh, I'm saying that I'm not talking about that meeting. I'm not talking about my meetings with world leaders. But you uh, there's do some talk that about are in meetings the book. with world leaders. There's some that are in the book, and then there's some that's not in the book. Damn! <laughs> I'm sorry, that was for Midas touch, but um, their little spin on it. But no, I love it. It's if this was her whole spiel, and it was just so stupid. Okay, I didn't mean to put that anecdote in the book. Well, wait, if it's an anecdote, you're saying it happened. Well, no, no, I'm not discussing that. Well, did it happen or not? Well, I'm not discussing my 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 meetings with world leaders. Well, wait a minute, you're promoting a book where you discuss this in the book. You discussed that you met with Kim Jong-un. You discussed it in the book, and now you're not discussing it? <laughs> and then what she said later on, oh, I had that portion taken out of the book, right? I had it removed once I became aware of it. Well, wait a second. It's an autobiography. Granted, it was ghostwritten. But it's like, okay, you didn't read it at all before the publishing, but you did do the audiobook, and you read that out loud which means you had to read it at least twice because they do multiple takes. So you read the audiobook, so you read that before it was published and you didn't have it taken out. And you read it on multiple occasions and you still didn't take it out. <laughs> so she kept trying to spin this and it just got worse and worse and worse and she was just drowning and drowning. And then after all that, after just getting slapped about, okay, you bragged about killing your, your family dog, and then you didn't mention your seven-year-old, going, Mommy, where's Cricket? <laughs> After you shot and killed the animal. And you think that that makes you look good, and you're bragging about that. Um, then, of course, you've got, so you've got that going on. Then, of course, you've got, you're lying about meeting Kim Jong-un and these other things. So now, the whole book is suspect. She shot her fucking career. It looks terrible. She's been on this tour. She's been basically reamed by every reporter on every newscast where she's gone to plug the book um where they've just been asking her about well tell me about the dog tell me about kim jong-un she's trying to walk it back walk it back finally it got so bad this happened governor Nome was scheduled to be on this program inside politics today her team reached out to us weeks ago to book her here and we reconfirmed earlier this week she abruptly canceled last night. All right, after a disastrous <laughs> week of PR, Christy so this is David Pakman, and 
<laughs> He's gonna go into why she canceled because this is hilarious. Holmes team, I guess, has decided no more interviews. And uh, Dana Bash announcing this yesterday on CNN. Take a look at this, and this little package includes a reminder of how this week has gone very, very wrong. Governor Kristi Noem has taken hit after hit on television this week about the story she tells in her own new book about how she shot her poorly trained dog and about not really meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, despite saying she did. Over the last week. I should not have put that anecdote in the book. Uh, that I'm not going to talk an about my meetings. But anecdote indicates that it happened, I'm right? Did the dog story President come up Trump. in a conversation I with Trump? I talked to President Trump all the time. Did you bring up yes, the dog enough, with Trump? Yes, enough, Stuart. With Trump. Did you this bring up the This interview is with ridiculous, Trump? what you were doing right now. When you recorded your own audiobook, you didn't notice I'm not going to discuss about my meetings with world leaders. I'm not asking you to. I'm asking you about recording the audio. Did you want to talk about something else today? <laughs> now. <laughs> so, yep, so she finally canceled it. And her excuse that she gave was uh, there was a snowstorm in South Dakota where she's the governor, and so she couldn't make it. Except for when she gave that excuse, she was in New York, <laughs> near the CNN studio. I can't make it because there's a snowstorm in South Dakota. <laughs> Even though I'm not in South Dakota. <laughs> so Christy Dome, I think she's tanked her chance of being Trump's VP. I think she's she really hurt herself. Luckily, she's in South Dakota. It's probably likely she'll she'll get reelected as governor again in the future. Um, but yeah, just terrible, terrible stuff. Um, so that's 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 it for Christy Dome today. She just kills me. Um, the whole thing about shooting the dog was just was just wild. Anyway, um, let me move on. Um, oh, okay, this will be a fun one. RFK. RFK. Some of you probably know. He's running for president. He's running as an independent. Tried to run as a Democrat. Didn't work. RFK's got a lot of a lot of wild views. He's, you know, does he's, he says he's not anti-vax except for he's anti-vax. He doesn't believe in vaccines. And he's uh, he's got some issues about. It. He thinks Wi-Fi causes cancer, so we should get rid of Wi-Fi. He's he's got some weird ideas. He's just a weird weird conspiratorial guy. He's yo-yoed back and forth on on a lot of different issues, abortion and whatnot. Um, oh, he said the January 6th rioters, he said that, that that was peaceful and none of them were armed and then he had to walk that back because that wasn't true. Um, just just a weird guy. And so we've said the guy's nuts. There's something wrong with him mentally. I mean, it's like it's almost like he's got worms in his brain. Well, <laughs> believe it or not, kids, he has worms in his brain. Right here, <laughs> Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says health issues caused by dead worm in his brain. I am not shitting you on this. This is real. So third party U.S. President Kansas 2020 or 2010 issue caused by a worm that got into my brain and ate a portion of it and then died. <laughs> so his brain is so toxic the worm died. <laughs> I just want to get into this. I just can't believe this. We've been saying it. We were joking, but apparently that was true. Um, so RFK Jr., third party candidate for president, said a health problem he experienced in 2010 because of a worm that got into my brain and a portion of it then died. Uh, the startling words were contained in a divorce case deposition from 2012. Um, two years before the deposition, the paper said Kennedy experienced memory loss and mental fogginess so severe that if a friend grew concerned, he might have a brain tumor. Neurologist who treated Kennedy's uncle in Massachusetts, Ted Kennedy, before he detonated from brain cancer, to that, told the young man, younger man, he had a dark spot in his brain skins and concluded he had a tumor. But Kennedy reportedly said a doctor in New York Presbyterian Hospital posted another explanation of parasite in Kennedy's brain. Speaking this way, the paper said Kennedy told the Times that at around the same time he learned of the parasite in his brain, he was also found to have mercury poisoning, which can cause neurological problems probably due to eating a lot of fish. Um, in 2012 deposition, Kennedy reportedly said, uh, I have cognitive problems. Clearly, I have short-term memory loss and I have longer-term memory loss that affects me. In his recent interview, the Times said Kennedy said that he had recovered from such problems. The paper also said Kennedy's spokesman Stephanie Spear responded to the question, um, about whether the candidate's health problems could compromise his fitness to be president, saying this is a layer suggestion given the competition. Now, 70 Kennedy has suffered other issues, including a heart problem from which he has been repeatedly hospitalized, a spasmodic uh, dysphonia, 
a neurological condition that affects his voice. <laughs> Nonetheless, this scion of famous political clan, his father was the U.S. Attorney General in New York, Senator F. Kennedy, and his uncle, R.F. Kennedy, 35th president. Okay. So this guy's got a lot of health problems. Um, I, I also heard somewhere, and maybe this is, I'm, I'm off on this, but uh, that he also had hepatitis C, which, cause, which can cause, and in his case probably did cause, scarring in his brain. That's what I understood. Um, I, I don't know much about it. I'm not a doctor. From what I've read from doctors and stuff, they said this stuff doesn't go away. Um, you can see some improvement, but not, you're never going to fully recover from from any sort of brain damage like that it's once it's there it's permanent um it doesn't it's not like your brain it's not like your memories come back or you can reform them um when you have that kind of brain damage it's 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 pretty permanent so i feel bad for him and that explains why his voice is so so bad it's that he has a neurological disorder that affects his voice um and how he speaks but yeah i feel bad for the guy but it is it's kind of funny that yeah this he's running and he's kind of a a nut job and he's saying a lot of crazy stuff and we reported recently that his his staff was run was was basically telling all their their uh their supporters he's not running to win he's running to be a spoiler to make sure that trump wins he's trying to steal votes from biden and that's the only reason he's running which is why he's only in a few states right now that he's registered in um so he's not even seriously running he's just trying to i think he's just trying to fuck with the election and I think part of it's because he's pissed because uh, he got blocked on, I can't remember what it was, Twitter or something, um, because he was saying all this anti-vax stuff that was crazy during COVID, and Twitter blocked him, and he blamed President Biden. So he thinks Joe, there's a conspiracy with Joe Biden to stop him from having a Twitter account or whatever. So yeah, he's a nutball, um, but that kind of ex kind of explains a little bit that you know that he may he might have some neurological damage. Um, now, he has a vice presidential person that he's picked already. Her name's Nicole Shanahan. Nobody really knew who she was. She's a wealthy person. She donated a lot of money to him. And she's kind of a libertarian in that job. Um, anyway, so she's the vice presidential pick for him. She's running with him. <laughs> Recently, she's interviewed, and they asked her about his stance on abortion. And she didn't know what he was talking about. She thought he had a completely different stance on abortion. So... Even just to show you how unserious this campaign is, his vice presidential pick is going on television or going on doing interviews for, for articles and stuff, and she doesn't even know his positions on the issues. That's how serious this is. So here's another article from NBC News. RFK Jr. appears to surprise his running mate with his position on abortion, okay? So... Independent presidential candidate RFK Jr. said in an interview released Wednesday that he would allow women to have abortions at full term if that was their choice. The latest answer he's given on the abortion policy and one that provoked a surprised reaction from his running mate. Now, in the past, he said, well, I would, you know, restrict it at a few weeks or and it would be illegal after that. He said he, maybe there shouldn't be any abortion. And then he's, he's, he's yo-yoed back and forth on this issue quite a bit. It depends on who he's talking to and what information they give him. But recently, that's what he said. Full-term abortions, by choice, fine. I don't really care what his opinion is, but fine. So that's his position. Okay, so during an interview with podcaster Sage Steele, the former ESPN host asked Kennedy what the limit should be for women to have an abortion. Should there be a limit, or are you saying that all the way up to full-term, a woman has the right to have an abortion? Kennedy answered that he doesn't think anyone would want, uh, would want to do that at eight months of pregnancy. Yeah, no shit. But abortion should be out of the hands of the government and in the hands of women. Okay, fine. Still continue to push Kennedy, asking if he agrees with the Roe v. Wade standard or with abortion being left to the states. And Kennedy reiterated the decision should not lie with the states, but with the mother. Even if it's full term, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, skip forward. The comments appeared to have come as a surprise to Nicole Shanahan, Kennedy's running mate. So this is the VP that he picked. A week prior to the release of Kennedy's conversation with Steele, Shanahan was featured in a podcast episode with the host. Steele asked Shanahan if she agreed with Kennedy's belief that a woman should have the option to have an abortion on full term, to which Shanahan responded with surprise. She said, my understanding with Bobby's position is that, you know, every abortion is a tragedy, is a loss of life, Shanahan said. 
My understanding is that he absolutely believes in limits on abortion, and we've talked about this. I do not think, I do not know where that came from. Shannon went on to say, that is not my understanding of his position. I think maybe there was a miscommunication there. Shanahan, who has not attended an in-person campaign rally since the March announcement that she was joining Kennedy's ticket, shared her abortion stance in this uh, post on X. And she just said, I will speak personally, Shannon wrote, as a mom and a person with a womb. Okay. I don't like the feeling of anyone having control over my body. It is coercive. It is wrong. I agree. But I'm also a woman that would not feel right terminating a viable life inside of me. Okay, good for you. Especially if I am both healthy and that baby is healthy. I can hold both beliefs as someone who believes in the sacredness of life simultaneously. Okay, that makes no sense. So I don't even know what her position is. <laughs> Let's see. They had another one. Kennedy told NBC News, I believe the decision to abort a child should be up to the women during the first three months of life. Preston, whether he meant signing a federal ban at 15 weeks or 21 weeks, he said yes. See, they're all over the fucking place on this. So it just shows you how not serious this campaign is. you got a guy with brain worms who can't even tell, and him and his VP don't even know what their stance is on something like abortion. This should be a pretty simple issue. You should have a firm position on this if you're running. And they don't even know what each other's stance is, or sort of where they lie. And she hasn't been at, at any campaign, anything, since they announced her over a month ago. So clearly not a serious campaign. Anyway, so just fun stuff. Doesn't know where he stands on abortion. Maybe the brain worm ate that portion of his brain and died. <laughs> oh, man. Hell. <laughs> Speaking of uh, conspiratorial nuts, with probably with brain worms, Marjorie Taylor Greene tried to, finally did it. She finally tried to oust uh, Mike Johnson. Um, Oust a second speaker now. God, it's been less than a year since they ousted what uh, McCarthy. Things are in total peril. They went from having an eight-vote lead, the Republicans had an eight-vote lead in the House, to now they just have one. And now she's going to oust the speaker, which would basically could basically give the lead to the Democrats, could make the House a Democratic House. Um, so she put it up to basically a vote in a contest to basically vacate the speaker. Uh, this is kind of how it went. I seek recognition to give notice of my intent to raise a question of the privileges of the House. The form of the resolution is as follows. Declaring the office of Speaker of the House Representatives to be vacant. <laughs> this is the uniparty for the American people watching. So yeah, she got booed, didn't pass, <laughs> didn't go through at all, pissed off the rest of the party. I mean, it was just terrible for her. Um, absolutely shot herself in the foot. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know where else it's going to go from here, but let's see. Let's see. I have, uh, what's his name? Luke Beasley, and he's going to cover a little bit of this. We'll jump into Luke. But yeah, just did not go well for her at all. Is Mike Lawler. Moscow Marjorie has clearly gone off the deep end, uh, maybe the result of a space laser. But uh, this type of tantrum is absolutely unacceptable, and it does nothing to further the cause of the conservative movement. The only people who have stymied our ability to govern are the very people that have pulled these types of stunts throughout the course of this Congress to undermine the House Republican majority. Moscow Marjorie has... And you hear him as the clip repeats saying Moscow Marjorie and that gets to what I previously mentioned the insanity of the demands from her included just completely cutting off any aid to Ukraine as they defend themselves and as I've said Marjorie Taylor Greene pretends like this is in the interest of peace trying to further the talking point of the United States is currently funding the continuation of a war when it comes to Russia's invasion of Ukraine which is just absurd and deranged. It is absurd and deranged, but thats I don't think that's the whole issue. I don't think that's the point at all. I mean, she hasn't really passed any bills. She hasn't pushed anything of any sort of significance for legislation. She's fought back. I mean, her whole thing is she's, she's one of the, I think she is, the biggest uh, fundraiser in the House. She makes the most money, and she gets it from the right-wing MAGA nut jobs. And so 
for her, she's always got to be stirring shit up and trying to get attention. And it doesn't matter what it is. And it doesn't have to succeed. And it can be as crazy as she wants it to be. She just has to be constantly in the limelight to soak up that money from the from the suckers that, that, that donate to her. Um, I mean, she's stuck in that cycle. I mean, you can say what you want about it, but that's kind of where it's at. I mean, she's a little bit like, like when you leave the cat at home for like three days while you go on vacation, you come back and the house is trashed. It's kind of like, oh, if you're not going to pay attention to me, then this is what you get. Right? So it's, that's kind of what she's doing. She's been out of the limelight, the Trump trial, everything else has been going on, has been sort of stealing it. And so she's got to jump back in there, man. Uh, and so what does she do? Do something crazy. Let's try to oust the speaker. That'll that'll get us some press. That'll get us some, some donor money. That'll give us something to fundraise off of with the nut wings. And that's what she did. I mean, I mean, there's not a whole lot else to say behind it. It's it's pretty, it's all pretty fucking shallow. It's all pretty, you know, surface level kind of, kind of political maneuvering. But yeah, Marjorie Crane just being a nutball again. She's a total, this is after she tried to, well, the one she tried before this that totally failed, but she tried to add into a bill that we needed to, uh, space lasers at the border. That's why they were joking about that. This is this is the years after she said the California wildfires were caused by Jewish-owned space lasers. I mean, anything to get... I think she, partly she is crazy, but I think partly it's, she has to have the attention all the time. She can't get the attention all the time and soak up the air out of the room then she's not going to get the fundraising because she hasn't done anything legislatively or anything substantially. The Republican House hasn't done anything <laughs> substantial. I mean, they're the most inefficient, the least productive House that we've had ever. Um, so that's just, I mean, they're just all going downhill. Not much to say about them other than that. Um, I'll jump into uh, Donald Trump. Besides campaigning from court and doing nothing else, really, uh, did an interesting statement recently, and I just kind of wanted to go over this. He's talking about abortion, um, and Trump says abortion, not that big of an issue. Uh, GOP is party of fertilization, so basically saying, I, I don't know exactly what he's saying. We'll watch some of this, because this is just bizarre to me. Um, My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others. And that's what they will be. The number of weeks now, people are, are agreeing on 15, and I'm thinking in terms of that, and it'll come out to something that's very reasonable. But people are really, even hardliners are agreeing, seems to be 15 weeks, seems to be a number that people are agreeing at, but I'll make that. Uh... So, yeah, it looks like he's gotten pretty far right here on the abortion thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't doubt that he'd sign a 15-week ban. I don't doubt he'd sign a total ban if that's what they want him to do. I don't think he's got a personal position on it other than what he thinks is most expedient for him or what's going to help him out the most. Um, this is very dangerous, though, because even if it's a, uh, the position we're at now where it's a state thing, where women have rights in certain states and they that they don't have in other states. Um, you know, you have the right to have an abortion in certain states and in other states you don't and in other states are trying to make it illegal for you to leave the state to get an abortion you got to remember on on the pro-life movement the anti-abortion movement their position is is that all life is sacred and that the abortion is murder and if that's the case then they have to prevent all of them from happening um they are kind of hypocritical on the same side which is if the goal was really to prevent abortion or reduce abortion, the best way to do it is through people not getting pregnant, which is sex ed, contraceptives, 
you know, uh, family planning, Planned Parenthood, that kind of stuff. That stuff reduces the amount of abortions. Uh, making it illegal doesn't necessarily reduce the amount of abortions. There hasn't been any evidence that it does. What it does is it makes makes it a lot more unsafe um, and harmful. And a lot of women are are getting sick and getting and dying, and you know, are having severe medical problems, or they they have a miscarriage. Um, an abortion is a pretty common treatment for miscarriage, and like one in four pregnancies result in a miscarriage. And if they don't get the abortion, they don't get that treatment, a lot of times these women can't have children ever again. Um, and it's life-threatening. And they can't get the abortion until it's life-threatening. So it's got to get to the point where it's, it's dangerous before we can even contemplate giving an abortion where we could have just given them the abortion because it's already a miscarriage. The child's not going to live anyway. Could have just given an abortion, they'd have been fine. But no, we have to wait. Um because of this sort of backwards thinking about it. Now, the other thing that really pisses me off about this whole thing is there's a, there's a confusion. When, when they talk about the dates, or when is it life, or what are the, what, when, when should it be, you're missing the bigger point, which is it's not, <laughs> it's about individual rights here, right? It's about civil rights. So if we're in the, I mean, this was the, the example they gave in Roe v. Wade. Um, I forget the woman's name, Jarvis, I think was her name. She came up with this. A very simple example. Let's say you're kidnapped and you wake up and you're attached, you're in a hospital and you're physically attached to a violinist, I think was her example. And he's the greatest violinist in the world. And you've got all these tubes attaching you to this person and they tell you, if you detach from this person, they'll die. Otherwise, you have to stay attached to this person for the next nine months. Now, the question isn't, should she do that? That's really kind of up to the person, you or whoever, that's attached to them, right? The question is, should we legally compel you to do it or imprison you if you don't? That's the question that's being asked. And that's the question with abortion. If a woman gets pregnant, right, and she doesn't want to have the child, or it's a miscarriage or something like that, and she gets the abortion, should we have the right as the state, as the government, to imprison that person or to punish that person for doing that? That's the question. It's a question of where, where does the government intercede on that decision, on that right? And is it a right? And, and Roe v. Wade, they determined it was a right, and that the government shouldn't have that kind of power to intercede on a medical decision. Um, so, I, and I agreed, uh, with that. I think that's probably, I think that's the only way you can play it. Um, Roe v. Wade did put in some restrictions. Um, I think it was like third trimester. You couldn't get an abortion unless it was medically necessary. Um, you know, but in that case, that's almost always the case. Nobody, almost nobody carries a baby for eight or nine months and then goes, you know what? Decided I don't want it now. No, that doesn't. By that point, it's viable. You could take the baby out and it could still live. Um, but that's not the issue. And when they talk about getting an abortion right up to full term, well, an abortion at full term is usually called a birth. You know, oftentimes they'll do a C-section or something. A C-section is a type of abortion. But the child lives. Uh, in that case, when we're talking about abortion in the way they're talking about. It, they're talking about it in the sense that. The, the fetus dies. But if it's viable, right, it's, you know, can live outside the womb, then, the Supreme Court says, or did under Roe v. Wade, then we're talking about, yeah, now it's, now it's murder. If it's not viable, and it's dependent on the, the mother to survive, then it's her body. She should have a right to say, I do or do not want to carry this thing. I do or do not want to be hooked up to the violinist. And whether you agree with that is right or wrong or moral or good or bad, it's irrelevant. The question is, should we have the right to force somebody to do that? That's the big question. And I think that always gets overlooked. And the main thing that's getting overlooked here is the rights of the mother. Because there are at least two people involved in that, right? The mother and the fetus or the child. If, if you want to say a fetus is a person, that's fine. I don't care. I don't agree with you, but I don't care because it's irrelevant. 
it doesn't mean it has automatic rights to the mother's body. That's the bold point. But they, they keep yelling back and forth on this. I don't know what else he's going to do. We'll watch a little bit more of this, but I, I think that's the danger here, is that they're going to take that right away, and we're going to go back to what it was like pre-Roe, where you had you know, the, 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 the pro-rights movement for abortion, the pro um, the pro civil rights movement for allowing women to have abortions, their symbol was a coat hanger because it used to be that, yeah, women would stick a coat hanger inside of them to try and scrape it out. That's how dangerous it was um, back then. And I, I think that's the problem is, is we've moved back to that. And he wants to move it even further back. Uh, announcement at the. too yeah where they're saying okay well it's gonna it's gonna affect the election um because yeah it's been a losing issue for the republicans they haven't won any of the abortion bills or or mandates or anything that's come along they've been voted down um people want this they want the right to do it most americans agree that that women should have the right to an abortion you know at least in most or in some circumstances at least um yeah, I don't know. What to tell you. I, I I hope this is a big issue. I hope everybody gets out and votes, um, you know, for people to have the right, um, because it's devastating how how it affects people. I mean, it was odd. They recently had a I can't remember where it was exactly, but they recently had a testimony that I saw where uh, it was an uh, OBGYN and she was testifying that um, they had a a girl who'd been was uh, eleven or twelve who'd been raped and was pregnant. Um, and she's testified it was so horrible that while, because she was in a state where she was forced to give birth, while she was giving birth, um, I mean, the girl was so young, she's holding onto her teddy bear and crying while giving birth. I mean, that's, that's the kind of draconian law we're talking about when we talk about anti-abortion. And they were right to point that out, that, that Trump's sort of trying to skate the middle here. It's still far right, but it's sort of the middle, but on the far right, like I said, these people believe that they're, it's murder to have an abortion. So you can't let anybody ever have that right to have the abortion. You have to take that away. And for Trump to sort of sit there and go, well, I'll leave it up to the states, that's not enough for them. And on the other side of the coin, it's no, no, we should have the right to do it. Right? We should have the right to do it, and a woman should have the right to choose what to do with her body. Just like anybody else should have a right to choose what to do with their body. So... You know, it is what it is. Um, honestly, if you want to reduce the number of abortions, it's contraceptives. Contra contraceptives and sex ed and helping people out. That's Education is how you do it. Um, and we've proven that. But the anti-abortion people don't want that. They don't want to reduce abortions. They just want to control women. That's, that's what the whole spiel is about. So, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. I kind of wanted to bring that one up. Um, let's go ahead and move on to... Uh, <clears throat> something a little bit happier. So now we've covered kind of the Republicans are up to all kinds of weird stuff. Trump's in trial for criminal acts of trying to subvert an election, falsifying business records, you know. We're getting into all the, the women he's paid off. Skipping over the, what, 20 plus, almost 30 women that have accused him of sexual assault. Um, all the craziness with the Republicans. Not really doing anything. Nothing's going on with them. What's going on with Biden, man? He's running for an election, too. What's what's Biden doing? What's he up to? Uh, let's jump in and find out what's Biden doing this week. Welcome back to America Decides. In 2018, then-President Donald Trump promised a massive Foxconn flat screen TV factory in Wisconsin would be the eighth wonder of the world. Well, that never happened. Fast forward, and tomorrow, President Joe Biden will be in the state to highlight Microsoft's plan to expand a data center complex there. 
Let's bring in our Aaron Navarro, who is covering the president's campaign. Aaron, it's great to see you. So President Biden is not only going to the state where Trump touted his project, he's going to the exact same event site, which feels like a little bit of trolling. So what message do you think the president has tomorrow for voters? Hi, Ouija. Well, this is the contrast the White House and more particularly the Biden campaign wants to make with Trump, that President Biden is actually getting some of these infrastructure jobs done, while President Trump did not. And as you mentioned, they are building, uh, expanding a data operations center uh, for Microsoft in Racine County. This is what the president is going to be highlighting tomorrow. And Parts of it will be built on parts of the land that was actually allocated and meant for the Foxconn project back in 2017. But all this is coming as polls show that voters in these crucial... Okay, so Biden's out there campaigning, creating jobs, expanding businesses. So let me tell you this story. So the Foxconn thing, Trump, it was one of the few big things he did as president. And it turned out to be a big nothing burger. Um, so Foxconn... In Racine, Wisconsin, they decided, okay, and Wisconsin's a swing state, so kind of a big deal for politicians. So Racine, Wisconsin, they said, okay, we're going to build this Foxconn, and they're going to build, I think, flat screen TVs was what the, what the focus was. And it's going to provide all these jobs, you know, tens of thousands of jobs, and providing like a, a thousand jobs or something, almost nothing. Anyway, it's going to provide all these jobs, and they're going to build this big facility there, and it's going to be great. Well, what it turned out was is there were all these tax cuts that were attached to it. Foxconn was not interested in building the infrastructure they were doing any of that. They just wanted the tax breaks. So what they did was they built a little bit and they hired some people, but they're basically do nothing jobs. Most of those people are sitting sitting in their, you know, cubicles watching YouTube or Netflix all day. But the only reason they're there and employed is because Foxconn gets a huge tax break for just having it there. So it was, the whole thing turned out to be a big tax scam at the end of the day. It's legal, but it's still a tax scam. Well, the problem is, is all that land is still sitting there, and it's still for sale, and it's still viable to build a facility on. So Biden and the White House got with Microsoft, cut a deal with them to, give them, to get them the land. So Microsoft is building a huge AI facility there, which is going to provide even more jobs than what Trump promised and didn't deliver. So... It's kind of a double double win here. I mean, it's a win-win-win for Biden. Because one, it's, it's a good policy procedure. It's going to provide a lot of jobs, help a lot of people out. It's going to do it in a swing state. And it's in the same location where Trump fucked up before. So, it, I mean, he's got a, it's a triple whammy there. It's, it's, it's good policy. It makes Biden look good. It's in a swing state, which is definitely going to now, I mean, now from the polling, looks like Biden's way up in Wisconsin because of this. And it's a it's a dig on Donald Trump. So win, win, win. Um, but watch a little bit more of this. But yeah, just brilliant, brilliant play for the president. Battleground states believe that former President Trump, not President Biden, have a better grasp on the economy. I'm glad you brought up uh, recent polling, Aaron, because, you know, back in 2020, this was such a close race. And obviously, Wisconsin could make or break, uh, you know, one of their runs. So talk to us about what else you're seeing in these polls and what issues really matter to the voters as it stands now. Well, let's start with the economy. In our latest CBS News Battleground poll of Wisconsin, specifically, only 33% said that they believe the economy is good, and that's among likely voters. 62% uh, believe that the economy was better under former President Trump. Hence, you're seeing President Biden try and puncture that argument, uh, that nostalgia that voters may feel, and as President Biden. And what's interesting is recently that's flipped, and now Biden's has got a six point lead shortly after this deal was done. This is right before the deal was done. So, good move on Biden's part. So Biden is out on the trail campaigning. They've got offices in all the swing states. They're out there knocking on doors, getting the independent voters, doing the traditional campaign shit. Trump's in court. They have to listen to, you know, his about his affairs and sexually harassing and insulting women and yeah, Christy Nome running around killing dogs and RFK with brain worm. I mean, I don't know. You guys can tell me what you think, but uh, I think it's pretty obvious who I'm going to vote for here. I mean, 
kind of don't have a whole lot of choice. <laughs> I mean, mine's okay. I'm not, you know, not a huge fan, but given the alternatives, it's like, shh, at least you got one guy who's actually doing the job, which all that really fucking I care about. So, anyway, that's all that's going on there. But yeah, just just wanted to throw that out there as a comparison. Here, look what look what Joe Biden's up to. The less crazy side of the coin, right? <laughs> anyway, we'll move on. Uh, got a couple quick things here, so let's do... Uh, oh, here we go. So, the Trump campaign, like I said, they're not really putting any offices anywhere. They haven't really done much to actually campaign because Trump's stuck in court uh, in his criminal trial. Um, but he did put... They, they took out the leadership of the RNC, he put his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, or Lara, whatever it is, she's in charge, she's one of them, people in charge now, and they've gone a whole different direction. So now all the RNC's money, all the campaign money they're making is pretty much going to pay off Trump's legal fees. So there is no ground game. They aren't knocking on doors, they aren't campaigning. They're not really helping out any of the other Republicans who are running this year, because all that money needs to be siphoned to Trump to pay off of his legal fee fees and bills, right? Well, now, Laura Trump is in a whole new position where recently um, they've decided, well, they're going to do this real sort of draconian kind of look at the election and kind of jump on voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud, which isn't really a thing. But they've gone all in on this. So they've got to focus all their attention, what little money they have left and resources on targeting voter fraud and stopping that even though it's not a real issue. Um, and the courts have determined that. Even Trump-appointed judges determined that in the last election when they, when they fought back against the election. The judges determined there's no evidence of any voter fraud going on. And most of the voter fraud that was found was very minimal, and it was almost all Republicans who were committing voter fraud. It wasn't, it wasn't anybody on Biden's side. So they dumped into this, and it's funny because the woman who's uh, running the voter integrity for the RNC she just got indicted for election for trying to steal the election for election fraud in Arizona from the 2020 election, where she was part of that whole elector scheme. So the woman who's running election integrity for the RNC is a criminal is criminally indicted right now in Arizona for trying to interfere with the election and manipulate the election. But now you got Lara Trump, and this is her whole thing. She is stuck in the voter fraud. They've got to do this. They're, they've gone balls to the wall. So she's going to tell you this, and she's going to kind of bullshit you here. And it's, it's going to be funny. But here she is on Maria Bartiromo, and she's going to kind of give up a little bit of the game here. You've been saying for a while now that your priority is to ensure a transparent election. And I see that the RNC and the Trump campaign filing a lawsuit in a battleground state to stop counting ballots past Election Day. What are you doing with regard to suing Nevada right now? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. You cannot have ballots counted, Maria, after elections are over. And and right now, that is... So we're already in deep... You can't have ballots counted after elections are over. Well, well you can, but typically you don't because the election's over. You've already decided who the winner is. We've already figured it out. Um, sometimes there are recounts, though. That happens. But no, that's what she. That's not how what she means. Because what she's saying is true. Typically, you don't count the ballots after the election's over. What she's saying is, we don't want to count ballots after we won or after the voting's closed. Well, the problem is, is once voting's closed, you haven't counted all the ballots. So what she's saying is, we just want to count the early ballots, which are typically the Republican ballots, because that's how they've set it up. Because Republicans tend to vote in person, as where most Democrats tend to vote by mail. Or, you know, not in person. And so they want to stop that. So they want to just, boom, as soon as we're ahead, we want to stop and close the voting. That's what she's talking about. That's the, that's the bullshit. It's one of the many lawsuits we have out across this country to ensure that just that happens, that we have a free, fair, and transparent election. So um, in Nevada, as you pointed out, we are saying we want on election day that to be the last day that mail-in ballots can be counted. And we've been very successful. <laughs> That's the problem, is the way it's set up in Nevada, they don't start counting. They're not allowed to start counting the mail-in ballots until election day. Do you see? 
you see how that spins a little bit, right? We don't want you counting ballots, the mail-in ballots after election day, because we know more Democrats vote by mail than Republicans. So we'll have all the Republican votes will be counted. We can count those after election day, but the mail-in ballots you can't count until after our count count after election day. But you also can't count them until election day, so you can't count them. <laughs> that's what. That's exactly what she just said. And of course, everybody knows that it's all bullshit. But that's what she just said. It's crazy. Successful in a lot of lawsuits. A couple weeks ago, we won a big lawsuit in the state of Pennsylvania. They wanted to take off dates from mail-in ballots. Of course, the Democrats, in an effort to make yeah. it easier to cheat, we pushed back on that. We won, and that set precedent for the entire country. So whether it's Nevada, whether it's Pennsylvania, or whether it's in New York City, where we actually just had a big win. That wasn't what the case was. They always put the dates. Because there's a post date on a mail-in ballot. So you can't take the date off because it's on the, the letter when it's mailed. The post office puts a post date on it. So if the post date is after the election, it doesn't get counted. That's not what that was about. That was about putting on dates for early mail-in mail ballots. So I could put in my mail-in ballot, like I live in Oregon, and I, can, I usually vote like two or three weeks before the election because that's when I get my mail-in ballot. And it goes in and then they wait and they count it when the election happens. What she's talking about is, well, no, we don't want that at all. Because if they put dates on them, and the, 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 we don't want them to be able to put them in earlier, right? Um, so we want it to have to be on the specific date. They sort of won that they didn't. They won that, oh, yeah, no, they have to put dates on them. Okay. The post office already does that. So it's kind of a ridiculous thing to say, okay, we're going to have to put a second date on it. Which is then going to end up being the same date. So it wasn't really a win for them. It was just sort of a technical nonsense thing. They were trying to uh, encourage 800,000 non-citizens to vote. We had a bipartisan effort led by the RNC. We won there. They are not going to be able to do that. And we are doing... Okay, that's a lie too. So what happened in New York with the 800 citizens... Uh, voting, uh, or non-citizens, sorry, voting, was there was uh, a bill that came out, I can't remember who pushed it, and it got shot down. It was stupid. And it, that's what it was. It was basically, well, look, they're not citizens, they can't vote federally, but they do live here and pay taxes. Even though they're not citizens, they're, they're immigrants, they're legal immigrants. So if we're having them here and they're doing that, they should at least be able to vote for, like, the mayor or comptroller or county commission or whatever. But then, of course, they came back and go, well, no, constitutionally, you can't vote unless you're a citizen. You have to be a citizen to vote. And then there's a process for them to get citizenship. And if they get citizenship, they can vote all they want. But, <laughs> well, I mean, they only get the one vote, but still. Um, but that's the point. And, and she's right. It was a stupid bill, and it got shut down. Even the Democrats were kind of against it. It was just an odd thing that came out. Doing those things all across the country because we can't be reactive. We have to be proactive. We have to look at this well ahead of election day and the election season that we now have in this country. We're doing everything from the RNC to ensure that that happens. So, what else can you tell us specifically that you're doing right now to ensure a transparent and free election in November? F what, five and a half months away now? Yeah, it's closing in fast, and, and we have uh, everything working at the RNC and the Trump campaign. Protectthevote.com. I can't overstate how important it is for us to get people on our election integrity team. It is the largest division we have right now at the RNC. If you want to volunteer out there to be a poll watcher, a poll worker, someone who can actually work in these polling locations and tabulation centers, we are now able to train you. We want you to join our team. If you're an attorney, we want attorneys volunteering as well because we want the in every single major polling location across this country to ensure that we are not waiting for weeks. So that's the comparison. You've got Joe Biden using all his money. They're out in states. They're out banging on doors, doing grassroots, trying to get people excited, trying to get people involved. you got Laura Trump going on the news saying we want to get people to get involved, not to vote for Trump, not to support Trump, but to jump on the voting and do voting integrity which really what we're trying to do is we want to manipulate the count. 
<laughs> That's what she's doing. This has nothing to do with getting people out to vote. This has to do with manipulating whose vote should count and whose shouldn't. That's what they're doing. That's the whole scam here. It's, a, it's just a game. And it's always funny. They say that le election integrity, securing the election, you know, making sure that the votes are counted, making sure it's a free and fair election, blah, blah, blah. It reminds me of the old uh, spy trick where they used to tell you um, for, for people doing like espionage or undercover work, and this was kind of an old trope, which was if somebody's trying to get you to go with them or do something and they use the terms, you know, safe, secure, we'll take you to a safe place, we'll make sure you're secure. If they use those words and they use them repeatedly, they're probably going to kill you. <laughs> Because if somebody's trying to help you, they don't need to reassure you that they're trying to help you all the time. They just help you. <laughs> That's the point. They've got to reassure, oh, no, no, it's safe and secure, it's free, it's, it's a balanced election, it's free and fair election, super election security, and it didn't repeatedly use those terms. And then what is she talking about? Let's avoid counting these votes here. Let's avoid counting those votes there. We want to repress counting these votes here. We don't want these people voting over here. They're trying to restrict the vote and restrict the count. So that's the whole scam with that. It's just a, it's just a joke. But that's Laura Trump. But uh, I wanted to get into one finance thing, real quick. Um, we'll do some more later this week. But we got a couple fun ones. But um, so last month, kind of an interesting thing. Um, uh, GDP would came in a lot lower than was expected. Uh, economy still good, but it was wasn't you know wasn't what, what analysts were hoping it would be. Um, inflation's up a little bit, uh, not a ton, but a little bit. And so it's at this point where the Fed is kind of, they've got the rates way up high, they're five point whatever, 5.7 something percent right now. Um, and that's the, the interest rates for loans, uh, for the standard interbank lending rate. So that means that like, it's more expensive to get a loan for a car or a house or for a business loan or anything, right? And so that ends up, the idea is that we, if we do that, it takes money out of the economy, it slows down inflation, it slows down the economy. And what it does do is it, it, it'll increase unemployment and it should reduce um, the number of jobs, right? Which means it'll be a, a more loose labor market, which is better for employers. It's worse for workers, but it's better for employers. Right now we have a very tight labor market and inflation has been going down consistently until recently it's gone up a little bit. but. Also, wages have gone up quite a bit. Now, the Fed's thought is okay, because they're thinking traditionally, by squeezing the market like that, we'll slow the economy down, and then that'll bring inflation down, and then we'll lower the rates. Well, since it's gone up, and they've done this, and they've raised the rates, it is sort of squeezing the economy, but inflation's going back up. Now, I would argue, maybe the thing that's causing inflation to kind of stay where it's at and go back up a little bit is the fact that the rates are so high that every, the cost of everything has had to go up because the loan money to start a business or to get the car or do anything, because it's so much higher, the cost have had to go up because businesses are having to pay all that money, so they've got to pass the cost down to the consumer. So it inflates the price of the goods because it costs them more to make them now, it costs them more to get the money. Um, but they're going to make this sort of same argument here on Yahoo Finance, which I think was really interesting. I thought this was a great, a great interview that they did. We want to bring in Mark Zandi. He's Moody's Analytics Chief Economist joining us now. Mark, it's great to see you here. So you've been talking about the fact that the Fed should be really thinking about cutting soon. We are clearly starting to see weakness within the economy. I'm curious, though, from your perspective, if the Fed does not cut this summer, what does that then do for the odds of a recession? Uh, well, it'll, it'll increase them. Uh, you know, I think the economy is fine. It's resilient. It's doing well. But uh, interest rates are high, and it's uh, you know, those rates are like a corrosive on the economy. They wear the economy down, and at some point, something could break. So the the risk that they're taking here is that uh, you know uh, they undermine the economy, and recession occurs. But you know, we're a long way from that, Shauna. Uh, I mean, I think the economy is you know, generally resilient. Uh, but I, I would, at this point. Uh, it, you know, if I were king for the day, I'd be uh, really uh, cutting rates at this point because I do think the economy could uh, use that relief. And I agree with him completely. It's rare that I see an interview where I agree, especially with another analyst. We people like us argue all the time about every little thing. 
But he's kind of nailed it. I think that he's right. I don't think that we're heading towards a recession. The economy's doing really well. Well, I don't think we're anywhere close to that. Um, I do think, though, that, that there is a risk, though, by keeping the rates high for a whole lot longer, that you increase the risk of something happening, right? There, there's some event occurs or something happens with the supply chain or, uh, you know, uh, heaven forbid, another pandemic or something breaks. It's something like that, and things are too and the interest rates are high and you're trying to cool everything off, then it exacerbates the problem. Um, there is a risk of that. And it's, I'm not saying it's likely, but it's a little bit higher of a risk than, than I would be comfortable taking. I would also argue that on that, that same note where he was talking about interest rates, that it is probably, probably not going to hurt too bad if they don't cut rates, but it would probably be the smart move right now to, to lower rates and cut them down a little bit to try and inflate the economy a little bit. Um, I, I don't think it's going to damage the, the whole deal with recession. Um, I don't think that's really a big risk on the table. And right I mean, it's always a risk, but I don't, I don't know that it's, it's something we should be ultra worried about at the moment. But they are going to get into another thing here, and I think this is interesting. Because he does a really good job here. I thought this was a great analysis. Mark, what happens, though, if it doesn't? If we don't see the Fed cut, when we talk about the risk here of something breaking in the economy, what does that then potentially look like? Well, uh, you know, it could be a number of different places. I mean, the financial system is under a lot of pressure. The yield curve, you know, we've kind of forgotten about that, but it's still inverted, meaning short rates are higher than long, meaning the funding costs that banks and other financial institutions face is high relative to their lending rates. That's, you know, that's not really a good place to be for a bank. Uh, particularly when uh, loan growth is soft because of the tightening and underwriting standards and regulatory costs are up because of the increased scrutiny, credit uh, conditions are eroding. So, you know, uh, the financial system is under a lot of pressure in, in that kind of environment. Uh, that that's that would be a good case uh, for something breaking. Uh, you know, we got a taste of that a little over a year ago with the uh, Silicon Valley Bank and in uh, the bank runs, so you know we've ex experienced something uh, like that. Uh, uh, but that's the kind of thing I'm I'm, I'm worried about in the context of uh, persistently high interest rates. So all these things considered, Mark, what are you going to be listening for in the tone of the Fed? I mean, we've had a bunch of Fed speak already this week, and we're gonna we're gonna end this week with even more Fed speak uh, tomorrow and one more speaker later today. What have you made an aggregate of what they have to say about their read on the economy thus far? Well, uh, they're taking a, a different position than I am. I, I mean, I, I, they clearly realize that these rates are high and that they're putting pressure on the economy, but uh, they are more focused on making sure that inflation is back to their 2% target. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the measure that they're focused on, the, the core excluding food and energy consumer expenditure deflator, uh, we're not there yet, so they they want to get there. Uh, so uh, I don't think at this point it's really about the data, less about what the Fed officials are saying. Uh, they've made it pretty clear that they're not going to cut rates until uh, inflation by that measure is at two, and so that's going to take at least a couple three months of data that uh, would square with that uh, forecast before they start cutting rates. So I expect they're going to just stick to that message and uh, you know keep pounding it until. The inflation data, uh, as they are, are focused on, comes in. Mark, should it be that two percent target? No, uh, it should, what should not. It be? Uh, you know, if I if if you were asking me de novo today, if, without the legacy of that two percent, mm. I'd say it should be closer to three. Uh, just given that the underlying growth rate of the economy is slower than when the two percent target was put into place. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think the, the Fed wants the Fed officials want to get back to two established credibility. Re make sure that they're, you know, they, they've done what they said they were going to do. So, yeah, that's that. I think that's the problem. They they, they want to stay, do what they said they were going to do. Um, whether or not that's reasonable, I guess, is the next question. And I'm, I'm with him. The 2% the interest target is kind of, or uh, sorry, inflation target is kind of, kind of low. And it also takes, I think they're looking at the data, but they're taking it, they're not taking it fully into context, I guess, is, or at least not the context that I, I would take it in. Um, because to me, you know, in a traditional sort of market, yeah, two seems about right traditionally. But things have changed. So you have to factor in um, just what's happened. 
So in the 90s, you had a huge boom with the dot-com era, and then in the 2000s, early 2000s, it was the two wars and multiple recessions. We had the 2001 recession, the 2002 recession, we had the 2008 um, Great Recession with the housing crisis, and then they had the slow, we had the slow, slow recovery from that, where interest rates were near zero, right, for a long time, and 2% inflation was about what we got. We had a very slow economic recovery from that. Then under Trump, economy slowed a little bit. Some of that was his fault, some of it wasn't. But then the pandemic hit. Pandemic wasn't his fault. His response was terrible. That was really devastating. And then Biden came in, dumped all this money back into the, the economy, into the people and with stimulus, and really bolstered the economy. But then there was an opportunity for businesses to realize that, oh, well, we can now overcharge people because they're coming back out of COVID and people are willing to pay it. So they did that and inflation rose to 9% instantly in their recovery because they got greedy. And they made a ton of money doing that. Um, but yeah, basically ripping off the American consumer because they knew we, we were all out of COVID, we were gonna buy it. And we had some extra money from the stimulus. So they basically raped, raped out the consumer on that. That artificially shot up inflation. Now it's come back down some, but it's still sort of that artificial figure there. So. With the other issues, we have a what's called a tight labor market, which means there's pretty much more jobs than people, which is why we have so much immigration right now. Um, it's because there's just all these jobs and these people are moving from other countries. They're looking for work and they're coming here. So you have all these things kind of conflating at once, happening at once, right? It's not just, I mean, the whole economic system of the world, all the commerce, just you have to factor in all the little things that are baked into the cake. Um, and I think that's being kind of ignored to just we're just going to focus on the data and when the data hits that magic number that's what we're going to do as opposed to he made a good argument well yeah if it were closer to three you'd probably be being more realistic for how hot our economy is and how well things are going as long as wages keep up it doesn't really matter what the inflation rate is um, you don't want it to be too hot because you don't want to have you don't want to run out of things you can buy because inflation is, is, is out of control um, or it's too low, um, but you also, as long as the wage growth is, is keeping pace or outpacing a little bit, which is ideal, then you're in a great position. It doesn't really matter. Um, it does matter for international trade and stuff because you don't want to outpace your, you know, your other countries too much to where you're just too expensive for everybody. So there's a balancing act here, but I think, I think like I agree with him. I think they're just too attached to that number. Two, which traditionally would have been the right thing to do, and especially under the Obama presidency, too, was about right. Um, but now things are a little bit, a little bit more robust, a little bit hotter. Um, I think they should probably adjust, adjust their their target. Anyway, I just thought that was a really, really sound analysis. I thought he did a great job. Um, he's from Moody's. Um, yeah, really smart guy. Uh, it's rare I agree with somebody, but I thought I'd share that. I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, anyway, uh, that's going to be our show for today. Thanks for joining. Uh, please like and subscribe. Uh, you can catch Lacey, uh, who's off today. She'll be back next week. Uh, you can catch her on uh, at her blog, mysensewithsense.com. It's down below. You can uh, feel free to email us if you have questions or if there's topics you want us to cover. Uh, if you have personal finance questions, definitely email us. And uh, you know, if you want to come on the show and, and discuss something or whatever we're game for it. So feel free, email us, gossipfinance88 outlook.com. Thank you everybody for watching and we'll catch you next time.